أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسماء The surah is the surah of, starts with this, Allah swearing, <coughs> Allah takes three oaths. For you to understand, first of all, because in the English language we don't do this, we don't take oaths in the English language, we don't swear often. When somebody does though, in a heated conversation, someone will say, I swear on X, I swear on my mom's life, I swear by Allah. Of course, we don't swear by anything other than Allah. But they swear by something to make another point. I swear by Allah, I'm not lying. I swear by Allah, this is my real wife. I swear by Allah, there's nothing wrong with this car. I swear by Allah, I got, this is the grace that I got, mom. There's no lie on the report. It is 10 out of 10, promise. So you swear by something to make a point. So here, what is Allah swearing by? Al-Buruj. Was-Sama'i that al-Buruj. The sky that is full of towers. Are there towers in the sky? Why is Allah saying, Was-Sama'i that al-Buruj. I swear by the sky, by the heavens that are full of towers. Where are the towers? Don't tell me these are the aliens we haven't discovered yet living in towers. I found aliens in the Quran. Don't tell me this. Where are the towers in the night sky? The stars. 
And this is something that uh, if you look at the surah before this and the surah after this, there's a common theme. What is the surah before this surah? Because we know the Quran is connected. The chapters of the Quran flow. There's a cohesive message. There's running themes. What's the chapter before Surah Al Buruj? Anybody know? Who can give me the first ayah of that surah? إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ The day when the sky will split. Okay. What's the surah after Surah Al Buruj? How does Tariq start? وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقَ is there a pattern? إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ Three surahs, different surahs, but there's something in common. What's in common? The word as-sama, the sky. All three surahs have one running theme. Allah is asking human beings to look up at the sky. First, to tell you, look at the sky. It's beautiful, right? There will come a day when it will be ripped apart. Be ready. Surah so Al-Buruj, Allah says, look up at the sky, look at the towering constellations of stars in the sky. When those stars connect up, they make towers, shapes, sizes. People call them constellations. The next surah, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ Allah swears by the sky and the shooting, the shooting stars in the sky. And نَجْمُ الثَّاقِبِ Constantly, Allah is asking us to look up at the sky. Something we don't do very much anymore. When was the last time we actually looked up at the night sky? We are, we are a generation that is so preoccupied with our digital devices. We should ask our grandparents, ask, ask the people with grey hair, what was it like in the age before the telephone? What did you do in the evening? They'll tell you, we used to look up at the night sky. There was nothing more beautiful than the night sky. Allah is asking us, the beginning of the surah, before we talk about what's the surah about, the first thing Allah is doing, He's swearing by the night sky. He's swearing by the sky rather. And specifically this time, He wants us to look at the towers, the towering constellations of stars in the sky. Because this surah is about a battle that takes place, a conflict that takes place, that will always take place in every century, in every land, in all of history, and forever in the future. It is the battle between oppressor and oppressed. Where do the oppressors sit? Where do they like to sit? They like to sit in their towers. They like to sit in their big towers, right? This is the first thing Allah is swearing. You like your towers? Look at my towers. You can't even reach them. You can't even see them. You don't even know where they start and end. You think you're a powerful oppressor? Let me swear by my creation. I swear by the sky full of towering constellations. Don't be deluded by your tower, my friend. There is something higher than you. This is the first message. Then Allah swears by another thing. And I swear by the promised day. The day of judgment has many names in the Quran. The day of standing, Yawmul Qiyamah. The promised day. as the hour. So many different words, phrases to describe the same thing, the day of judgment. Here Allah uses the word promised day. Why does He use the word promise? Usually you make a promise, you know, I'm sitting in a gathering, my child is saying to me, look, Baba, please can I play with this toy? Can I please have some cake? I say, look, no, but I promise you later I will give it to you. The word promise is used when you have a non-ideal situation, but you want someone to be optimistic about the future, about the later. Allah in this ayah, first he was talking, beginning, he was talking to the oppressors. You like your towers, right? Look at my towers. You like, you like the height at which you look at everybody else beneath you? Well, look up at the sky, my friends. You are nothing. You're not even a speck in this universe. Then Allah talks to those who are struggling, oppressed, living through difficult, challenging times. And Allah says to them, I promise you, get through this. I have something better in store for you. I promise you. Children don't usually trust our promises. 
We say, I promise you I'll give this to you later. I'll have you have a slice of cake later. And we just hope they forget about it. Three days later, Baba, remember that slice of cake? Oh yeah, the slice of cake. SubhanAllah, look at the sun. It's a beautiful weather today. Try to distract them. Yes. But when Allah promised, he, Allah wants us to hang on to His promise because the oppressed people have nothing. They have nothing to look forward to. They have no retirement, no pension plan, no playground. They have nothing to look forward to except one thing, the promised day. Whatever Allah promises them, that's all they have. The third, swear. Allah swears by the witness and what is being witnessed. Who is the witness? And what is being witnessed? Yes. Allah is the witness. The believers are witnesses of what's happening. And even the oppressors are witness. Everybody is seeing what's happening. But there is one thing that oppressors are great at. They are great at propaganda. They are great at lying to the public. Fir'aun is the greatest case study of this in the Quran. A great case study of doing something, oppressing people, but then telling everyone, I am the advocate for human rights. That's what Fir'aun does in the Quran. Me, ma uriyukum illa ma ara wa ma ahdiyukum illa sabil al rashad. I'm showing you the correct way. I'm showing you the moral way. I am the champion of rights and human rights, guys. Fir'aun is telling this to the public. This is what oppressors in history have always been known for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa shahidin wa mashhud. I swear by every witness, every pair of eyes on this earth, they belong to me. And I am the greatest witness. Later in the surah, Allah uses a name to describe himself. Wallahu ala kulli shay'in shaheed. Allah is shaheed. He is the greatest witness. Where do we see witnesses? In which context in this earth do we are witnesses called upon? In a court of law to serve justice. When Allah is swearing by witnesses, it is to indicate in this world you will have injustice. But there is a day in which all the witnesses will gather in my court. Everyone who saw what was happening will gather in my court and justice will be served. Injustice hurts us, it pains us. We cry over the pictures, over the images, over the videos, over the tweets, over the news of what's happening in parts of the world that are severely, people are oppressed, dying, being bombed, being shelled, only because they say, La ilaha illallah. And the injustice kills us on the inside. Use this feeling that you have, and remember what Allah is telling us now. وَشَاهِدٍ mashhud. There is a witness, there is a court of law. If the International Court of Justice does nothing, if the local courts do nothing, Allah's court will have the final say. Allah takes three qasams, three oaths, to make a point. The point Allah is making actually comes towards the end of the surah. When Allah says, Allah is saying, I swear by the sky, I swear by the promised day, and I swear by the witnesses here, that all those who are being burnt and chopped and sliced and killed for no reason other than their Iman, I have promised them they will have paradise, gardens beneath which rivers flow. Allah takes three, He swears three times to prove His point. And then Allah begins to narrate a story. This story, we don't know who exactly the people are, we don't know exactly where is it set, what time, what date, how long were they there? We don't know all the details, but we know one thing. It is the story of every oppressed nation on this earth. It is the story of the Palestinians. It is the story of the Syrians. It is the story of the Iraqis. It is the story of the Afghanis. It is the story of the Iraqis who were conquered and destroyed and a million of them killed by the Mongol invaders led by Genghis Khan. It is the story of every people that are ransacked, pillaged and murdered only for one reason. For la ilaha illallah. Allah begins to narrate the story. Qutila ashabul ukhdud. The people of the trench were killed. This is a very strange way to name these people. 
When you have a nation, you name them according to where they are from, the land they are from, Palestine. But Allah here is naming them according to the way they died. The story of these people is that these are people who believed in Allah. But their king, their tyrant, their dictator said, whoever says la ilaha illallah, I will put them in a trench, I will dig a hole, a pit, I will put them there and I will burn them alive. And I will sit on the sidelines watching. This is the story. Allah doesn't call these people by the land they were from. Syrians, Palestinians, we don't know where they were from. Allah doesn't call these people according to their family name. Khans, Bakris, Oasis. We don't know who they are, which family they're from. Allah has named them according to the place and the way they died. Ashabul Ukhdud, the people who were burnt in the trench. That's their name. Because they may have had many identities, ethnic identities, tribal identities. They may have had professions. Some may have been tailors, some may have been barbers, some may have been locksmiths. All of these identities don't matter on the Day of Judgment. Only one thing matters, how did you die? That is how you will be raised. Allah actually honors them by naming them the people who were burnt alive for my sake. This is the greatest honor they can have. Because by that Allah has promoted them from locksmith to person who will be living in the highest rank of paradise. From whatever ethnic identity they have, whichever country, whichever passport they hold, Allah has upgraded them. It doesn't matter who you are. You are a shaheed. You have died for my sake. You will have a very special status in paradise. How did they die? Allah begins to describe. A fire was lit with coal and fuel underneath. The king and his crew were sat on the side, enjoying. It is not just that they wanted to burn these believers alive, they wanted to enjoy watching it as well. And they were shuhud. In this surah, four times this word comes up. Shahidin wa mashhud, shuhud, shaheed. Allah keeps mentioning this word in different contexts to make a point. Everything is being witnessed. There was no CCTV in those days. There's no recording, no news, no TikTok videos. No first-hand witness evidence, no. But Allah was witness. They were witness. The people dying were witness. Everything will be brought to forth on the court of Allah on the Day of Judgment. They were witness to what they were doing. What issue did they have with these people that were being burnt alive? The only problem they had, and the only problem people have with the Palestinians, and the only problem that was there with the Iraqis and the Syrians, and, the, and when the Mongols invaded, and when every country and every nation invaded the believers, it was only for one reason. Why do they say, La ilaha illallah? It is under the guise of this Iman that the believers are attacked, killed, threatened, bombed, burnt alive. Allah ends this ayah by describing three of his names. Allah, Al-Aziz, Al-Hamid. This surah teaches us, if you want to get through this situation, if you are an oppressed Muslim, or you are witnessing the oppression, the most important way for you to get through this situation is for you to know Allah. In this surah is the longest passage in this 30th section of the Quran, the longest passage describing Allah in the surah. Aziz. What does Al-Aziz mean? Can anybody tell me? Mighty. Anything else? Al-Aziz. What is Izza? Respect, honor, dignity. What is Aziz? Hmm? The one who is never beaten. This is the most accurate translation. Al Ghalib. Al Aziz is one who can never be overcome. There was a time, this is what we used to say about Roger Federer in tennis. 
He had a good streak for a good few years. Nobody could beat him, any grand slam, it wasn't happening. There was a time this was said about Manchester United. <laughs> was there a time? I don't know, I'm not sure. May Allah grant them a time one day. Um, <laughs> the one who overcomes and no one can ever beat. This is what Aziz. And the one who possesses honor. Because when you look at people being chopped up alive, burnt alive, you think, what kind of a humiliation is this? These are the people of Iman? Allah supporting these people? Look at that child. Look at how he's trembling. These are the people supported by Allah. Allah is telling you, he is Al-Aziz, the source of honor and dignity. Your definition of honor is not his definition of honor. His definition of honor, you will see on the Day of Judgment, when people will be sitting on thrones in paradise. That is the honor that Allah gave them. Al-Aziz, the one whose will cannot be overcome. If Allah wills a thing to happen, nobody can overturn it. When Allah wills this conflict to happen, nobody can overturn it but Him. But He is Al Hamid. What is Hamid? Sami Allahu liman Hamida. What is Hamid? The one who is worthy of praise. The one who is worthy of your sacrifice. When Allah says Al Aziz, He's talking to the oppressor. You think you're mighty? You think you have a, will, a win streak, a kill streak? You can't beat me. Al Hamid, now he's talking to the oppressed. You're dying, you're sacrificing your life, your possessions, your wealth for my sake. I am worthy of your sacrifice. I am Al Hamid. I'm worth it. Many people ask, was it really worth it? Is it really worth dying upon La ilaha illallah? All of the pain, all of the severe suffering, why don't you just give it up? Allah is saying when He says, Al Hamid, I am worth it. In fact, you should wish, you should wish that I honor you with such an ending. Allah then begins to describe Himself. Allah owns, He has the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. Wallahu ala kulli shaheed. And Allah is a witness over all things. Why does he talk about I am the owner, mulk, I own everything in this world? Why does Allah talk about that? Is it to remind people that he's worth praise? Is it to remind people that he is worth praise? Do we have any other ideas? Why is Allah talking about his ownership of all things? in the middle of a story about Muslims being burnt alive. Yes? You say everything comes from his creation. Let me give you an analogy. Can I take this microphone home? Can I break it right now? What will happen to me if I break it? Zayan's obviously going to give me a choke slam. <laughs> and we know Zayan's been preparing for that for a very long time. Why can't I do that to this mic? It's not, it's not mine. Okay. Let me find something that belongs to me. This is my very empty wallet. Can I rip this up now? Yeah. It's mine, right? I can do what I want. Allah is saying in the middle of the surah, this world is mine. I do what I want on this earth. Don't question me. Because in this moment, many people question Allah. Where is Allah? Why isn't Allah stopping the suffering? Allah says, Habibi, look, you stay in your lane. You can't even park in a straight line. <laughs> this is my kingdom. I do as I please. La yus'alu amma yaf'al. He is not questioned. Wa hum yus'alun. You will be questioned. This is what, what's his name? Uh, I forgot his name. He says on his question, his show, the gentleman who's been interviewing a lot of Palestinian activists. Sorry? Piers Morgan. What Piers Morgan says, right? Don't ask me questions. This is my show. I ask the questions. Allah says this in the Quran. Don't ask me the questions. I ask the questions. لا يسأل عما يفعل. He is not questioned. وهم يسألون. You will be questioned by him. When we ask this question, where is Allah? Why hasn't he put an end? We forget. He is the ultimate authority. He is the Malik. He is the owner of everything. He owns me and you. If he wishes now for lightning to come from the sky and strike me, he can. I'm his. I belong to him and I will go back to him. It is up to him how he wishes to run this world. And Allah wills for there to always be a sira' in Arabic, a conflict 
a, tie, uh, you know, a tug of war. The tugging between good and evil. Allah wills that this has to take place on this earth. That there will always be some form of evil. People of evil. And there will always be good people who have to stand up and repel. That is how he designed this earth. Because this earth is not paradise. He, he is the king. And he has set it up in this way. He wants to see, this is the test, he wants to see who proves themselves to him. Which hypocrites turn their back and run? And which people hide in the corner and say, what conflict? There's no conflict. Allah wants this to happen. He is the king. He intends this to happen. This wasn't a mistake. This was designed. Many times you're using an application. And you think, hold on, something's wrong. And you report it by email. I report a bug. They say, this wasn't a bug. This is a feature. Yeah. It wasn't a mistake. We put it there on purpose. Yeah, Allah is telling us in this ayah. This is my kingdom. Nothing is here by mistake. I put it there on purpose to test you. الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد. Now Allah talked about the story, what happened, who was killed, who was killing them. Now Allah begins to talk about the consequences. Often today, if you turn on the news, people will talk about what's the solution, two-state solution. One state solution, everybody's thinking about immediate consequences. Will this person enter the war? Will that person exit? What's going to happen in the region? Allah's analysis is different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala skips everything in this world. He says, you want to see the consequences of this deed, of this situation? I will tell you the consequences. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا Those who were burning believing men and women and they never repented from that act. فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْحَرِيقِ they, Their consequence is they will taste Jahannam and they will have the fire of hell. What about those who suffered? What about the children? What about the innocent civilians? What about the women? Allah is going to tell you, don't worry. Just imagine that woman who lost her child, cradling her child as she drinks from the rivers of paradise. You just imagine those traumatized children playing around, enjoying their young years under the shade of the trees of paradise. You just imagine those elderly people who died for no fault of their own, reclining on chairs as they get feet massages from the young boys of paradise. Allah is saying, don't worry about these people. It's my mug, right? It's my microphone, right? I will look after it. You don't worry about them. Why are you worrying? You worry about yourself. Let me look after my creation. Allah is saying to you, don't cry about the children of Gaza. Don't cry about the women of Gaza. I have something far better in store for them. That's why I brought them back early. I took them back early so that I can treat them to something that you can never treat them to. They have had the greatest victory. Political analysts will tell you, this is happening, that's happening, victory, defeat, surrender, advancement. Move all these terms to a side. Look at the divine analysis. The people who died innocently, the people who died with no blame, but they held on to their Iman, they have the greatest victory. Victory is not about ammunition. Victory is not about advancement. Victory is not about who owns the land. It's not about reclaiming houses, reclaiming this and that. Victory is about one thing. If you die, you die upon la ilaha illallah. That's the greatest victory. We have a warped sense of victory. We look at those people who are suffering and we think, how terrible. I would never want to be in that situation. Allah is telling us, you are the loser. They won. They won the greatest victory. ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرُ now you're comforted about the people that are dying, that are oppressed. Now those who are being oppressed are comforted about their ending. Now Allah turns to the oppressors. He's not going to leave them. Inna 
the punishment of Allah is severe. إِنَّهُ هُوَ يُبْدِئُ وَيُعِيدُ He made you from nothing and He's going to make you again. He's going to recreate you and you will stand in front of Him. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودُ This ayah. In the middle of scaring the oppressors, telling them off, telling them He's going to seize them, rip them to shreds and bring them back, he says something. When you read it the first time, you think this is bizarre. He is the most forgiving and the most loving. Even to the oppressor. Even to the genocidal maniac. Even to the pharaoh, Allah is telling him, you know what? You can turn back as well. Because I am the most forgiving and the most loving. If you turn back, you still can. I still have some love for you as well. Imagine. Imagine if Adolf Hitler had read Wa huwa al wadud maybe he would have changed his ways. Imagine if Stalin read Mussolini Wa huwa al al wadud maybe they would have changed their ways. Imagine if Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi read and maybe pondered a little bit Wa huwa al al wadud maybe he would have changed. Every tyrant, Allah is not just giving them the telling off, He's giving them hope. You can change your ways as well, my friend. You don't have to keep going. Turn around, I'm still here. And this is also a message to the oppressed. This name of Allah, Al-Wadud, it is Allah's most intense form of love. The most intensely loving, Al-Wud. This word in Arabic, Al-Wud, is mainly used for maternal love, unconditional love. The kind of love a mother gives her child. Her child might be the greatest criminal in the world. She says, I don't care what he is, he's my son and I love him. He's, she's my daughter, I love her. This unconditional love, Allah says, I have this love as well. But I have saved it for those people who have died for my sake. The owner of the glorious Arsh. The Arsh of Allah is the most greatest of His creation. It is, it is even greater in size than this universe. You can't imagine. Allah says, every king Every powerful person, every tyrant, you have a arsh, you have, you have a kursi, you have a throne. You think you own the world because you sit on a nice big chair. He says, my arsh encompasses the heavens and the earth. What are you going to do? He does whatever he wills. He does whatever he intended. Like I said before, he owns the mug, he can crush the mug. He owns the microphone, he can take it and do it. It's his. He decided this earth needs to have conflict to test us. And what he wills to happen will happen. فَعَالٌ لِمَا يريد. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows us, He asks us to look back in history. And if you are sleeping, I'm going to ask you to wake up now just for this question. هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْجُنُودِ O oh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O believers, did you not hear about the other soldiers? Fir'aun wa Thamud. Fir'aun and Thamud. Now we have three stories in this surah. Ashab al-Ukhdud. Fir'aun and Thamud. What's the difference between these three stories? What's in common between these three stories? Okay, these are three stories of oppression. Fir'aun and Banu Israel. Ashab al ukhdud and their tyrant king. And the people of Thamud and how they dealt with Prophet Salih and the believers. Same story, but what's the difference? Yes, uncle. Great punishment for everyone. Okay, there is something in common. There was a great, in the end, the believers always won. There was a great punishment for everyone. Same examples of oppression and oppressed. That's what's common between them. Oppressor versus oppressed. But there's something different between each story. For example, how did, how did the oppressor story end in the story of Fir'aun and Musa? What happened to the oppressors? Drowned. They drowned. What happened to the oppressors in the story of Thamud? So, somebody said there was a sound. There was a divine miracle. 
there was something like a, a blast from the sky and they were dust. And what happened in the story of Ashab al Ukhdud? We don't know what happened to the oppressor. We just know the believers were burnt alive. Allah is saying three stories of oppressor versus oppressed, but three different endings. This is not Disney. They don't all have a happy ending. In one ending, the oppressors drowned. In another ending, the oppressors were blasted to dust. In another ending, the oppressors stayed in power. Three different endings. Who decides which ending the Gazans get? Allah. Fa'alun lima yurid. That's why before this he says, I do what I want. The ending, same story, same group, doing the same things. But is it always going to end in the drowning of the majority of oppressors? Is it always going to end in a blast from the sky? Only Allah knows the ending. But these are three examples. Allah says, pay attention. These were massive armies, junood, big forces. I can end them like this if I want. I can make it a 20 year battle if I want. I can make it a 150 year battle if I want. I can drown them if I want. I can sink them into the earth. I do what I want. You watch. You be patient. You make dua. You seek my help. And then I will show you what I'm capable of. The disbelievers are in denial. They are deluded. They think that by their numbers and their artillery and their political alliances and their forces that they will be the winners. Right now in Gaza there's a siege. The Gazans have been surrounded. Look at the word Allah uses here. Allah has surrounded them. Every superpower thinks they can surround their victims. Every oppressor thinks, I've got them covered. But Allah is saying here, I am the one who has you covered, my friend. Don't worry. I have surrounded them, not vice versa. This Quran, this is the most honorable Quran. But this Quran existed before it came down to Muhammad. Where was it first? Can somebody tell me what this is? The protected tablet. Yes. You're saying when you have good times and good deeds, you get hasanat? Yes. MashaAllah, that's absolutely true. But what is the lawhul mahfuz? Yes. It is, it, it is the book in which everything is written. History, past, present, future. But where is it? Hmm. Yes, young boy. Where is it? That's, that's the book you get on the Day of Judgment. But where is Allahul Mahfud, this record of everything that is to happen? Yes. It is with Allah. Anybody else? Yes. At a safe place, Zan, have you got any idea? Are you saying it's in the storeroom here somewhere? <laughs> it's in the heavens. Anybody else? Under the throne. Under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this is all we know. Even the throne of Allah is the creation of Allah that I'm not able to comprehend. What exactly is the throne of Allah? There's a hadith about it. I won't go into deal, but Allah is telling us there is a book, there is a tablet. Not an iPad tablet. Yeah, there is a tablet in which everything that happened and everything that will happen, the results have already been written down. Don't worry about the outcome. I decided it already. Take solace, take reassurance, take rest, because I'm the one who writes the code. I'm the one who decides the script. You just take the test I've given you and react in the appropriate way. Everything has been decided by Allah. This is the surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. When him and his companions were under the most torture, the most difficulty, the greatest of challenges. And in this surah, Allah is teaching them a very important lesson. 
The greatest of tests can be overcome if you know who I am. That's why the surah has a detailed explanation about who is Allah. And the smallest of tests will make you shake if you don't know who I am. Trust me and trust my promise. Well, yawmil maw'ud, trust the promised day. I am the witness and you are witness and everybody is witness and there will be a day I will call the witnesses. The oppressor might be strong, might be powerful, might have resources, but his tower doesn't reach the heavens and his authority stops at the edges of his, the boundaries and his territory. But I own all. I am the king. Don't forget, I am in control. History is in the hands of Allah. The future is in the hands of Allah. The Palestinians are in the hands of Allah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and his attributes. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana fi Filistin. Allahumma kun lahum waliyan wa nasira. Allahumma kun lahum zahiran ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma arina fihim ajaiba qudratik. Innaka anta al-jabbar. Allahumma nas'aluka al-maghfirata wa al-rahmata ya rahman. Allahumma arham mawtahum. Washfi mardahum. Wa'afi mubtalahum. Allahumma akrimhum bi shahadati ya rabbal alameen. Wa yassir umurahum ya rahman ya rahim. Wa akhu da'wana al-hamd. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته